Uh, now, uh, more on the infrastructure side. Uh, the first one uh, by David and Chaoying uh, on the Metaflow team at Netflix, who will talk about uh, fast and furious uh, data access in Metaflow. Great, thank you. Hey, thanks for sticking around. It's been a long day. We're going to give you two uh, final talks that I'm really excited about. Uh, this one's about fast data. So as you're aware, Metaflow is an open source uh, product. But here at Netflix, we have some internal plugins. The next two talks are going to be up about those plugins. Uh, so what is fast data? Why did, why did we build this thing? So uh, there's, lots of, there's lots of tools out there to do uh, data processing, as you heard from some earlier talks, like Spark. You can basically infinitely process any data set and land it in any other data set. Now, those tools are great if you want to stay within your data warehouse. But what we built here is the last mile data processing. So this is about getting data from your data warehouse into your Python process. And why do you need to do that? Well, you might need to do some custom Python transformations. You might need to batch inference and uh, or do training. And so how this works at, at uh, Netflix is that we use the fast data product to pull already nicely organized tables, nicely partitioned tables, uh, into your Python process for the bulk scoring. Uh, we're going to show you uh, a few examples. I'm going to give you a little overview of the product. And then uh, Chao Ying is going to go through an example that's going to blow your mind. Uh, so why did we build it? Well, it's scalable and robust. Uh, we need this to work in production. Uh, performance oriented. And everything that I'm going to show you has no software dependencies whatsoever. That's a really important feature we'll touch on in a bit. Uh, and, and finally, it has an extensible uh, custom C++ layer. So we can like write our own operations if Pandas or Polars or PyAir or any of these other softwares uh, don't provide it. Uh, so here's what, here's what the kind of stack looks like. At the very top, you have um, the Netflix data warehouse. Uh, the, all of our data warehouse is Apache Iceberg, or most of it. We've uh, moved over from kind of the legacy Hive system to Apache Iceberg. So Apache Iceberg serves as the metadata layer describing all of the tables in our data warehouse. Uh, the actual tables are backed by Apache Parquet files. Many of you are familiar with that, I'm sure. And then all of the data lands in AWS 3, which uh, from our perspective, is, from my perspective as an infrastructure engineer, is essentially an un unlimited storage with unlimited throughput. Um, what we've built is two uh, user interfaces here. Metaflow.table and Metaflow.dataframe. Uh, Metaflow.table is about interacting with the data warehouse, doing uh, scanning and discovery. Metaflow data frame is our in-memory representation. This is how your data is going to land. Uh, you can think of it as like a highly performant pandas without like some of the data science features. It's really just about storing the data. Um, at the end of the day, you can output any of these things to whatever kind of framework you want. Apache Arrow, Pandas, Polars, or even some custom C++ code. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the first layer here. Um, we've implemented a subset of the Apache Iceberg spec. The Iceberg team has done an excellent job of making a very well-defined spec. So you don't necessarily need to use the Pi Iceberg client that they provide. You can go ahead and implement your own if you have some special requirements, as we did. Uh, it was designed for pa uh, fast partition-based scan planning. So we don't implement the entire spec. We only implement the part of the spec that we know we can do extremely well and quickly. It has no software dependencies. We roll our own Avro reader uh, that doesn't require PyAvro or any of the other softwares. Um, well, that's not exactly true. We do depend on AWS S3. <laughs> Uh, we've also built a high-performance S3 client, which, by the way, this is available in Metaflow open source. Anybody can use the S3 client. It is the backbone of what we are doing here. The S3 client helps us move the Parquet files from the uh, data warehouse uh, into our local machine. You can read a nice blog post by Vile and his uh, crew over at Outer Bounds that talks about how when you use our S3 client in this way, you actually can keep much of the data in memory. It doesn't even spill the disk. This is due to Linux page caching, and they describe that in great detail. So even though we're actually pulling data from a uh, data warehouse and landing it in a local machine, it, it actually never touches disk. Uh, we have this hermetically sealed parquet decoding system. So this is the, the Metaflow data frame. So we've discovered the data. We moved it to our local machine. And now in parallel, we need to decode it. 
Uh, so this is going to give us the actual rows of the data frame. Now, there's lots of softwares that do this decoding. An Apache Arrow or Pi Arrow, if you're in the Python universe, is the one that you would most normally use. We wrap the Apache Arrow project, build it ourselves, and build a custom Python wrapper for it. And we distribute, along with Metaflow internally, this uh, shared objects. This is a, a Linux shared object. Now, you, this seems like a lot of machinery, and you might be wondering why we do this. It makes it dependency free. Uh, this means that we don't depend on Pyro or any other package. And why are we so uh, serious about dependencies? Well, the machine learning softwares themselves that our users want to use may have dependencies on all of these softwares. For instance, Pandas has a dependency on Pyro. Polars might have a dependency on Pyro. They may all depend on different versions, and we can quickly find ourselves in an unresolvable environment. So we take care of that for you by packaging it. Now, by doing this, and since we're already in the C++ layer, this also get, allows us to make custom functions that, wouldn't, that don't exist in some of the other softwares. And we are trying to go forward. Ah, there we are. OK, let's talk about uh, performance and how much this thing gets used at Netflix. And then we're going to quickly pass over to Chow Ying. Uh, 2023 usage of this software. It's, heavily used in uh, the Metaflow side of the house. 400K distinct tables accessed. Might seem like a lot, but a lot of people are creating temporary tables and then reading the data back in through Metaflow. Again, use the best of Spark, create a temporary table, and then use the best of Metaflow by pulling it into your process. 33 million read requests uh, for tables. This is because we're using a lot of horizontal scaling to process large tables in parallel. Chow Ying will tell you a little bit more about this. Uh, we'll, we'll look at how this matches up in real workflows, but we get about, on a single process, we get about 1.7 gigabytes per second. And that's not just the file download. That is discovery, file download, and decoding. Uh, so we're getting 1.7 gigabytes end to end. Uh, and it's kind of similar for writing. It's a little bit uh, lower because the parquet encoding is slow. Uh, most importantly, I won't go into the details, but we have different approaches. Uh, Presto-based approach and the Spark SQL approach, well, we're much faster, orders of magnitude. And then I had mentioned this uh, special C++ layer um, that allows us to do some things that pandas couldn't do in a much more memory efficient way. OK, let's look at a use case. Chow Ying is going to blow your mind with how much data you can process with this thing. Yeah, so thanks, David, for all these amazing metrics. And before jumping straight into use case, I want to show you some good stuff about Iceberg. So Netflix moved from Hive to Iceberg starting 2020. It comes with an independent, let me try, okay. It comes with an independent metadata layer so that we can allow us to do scan planning without knowing anything about the underlying storage system. It also has elegant error handling and retry mechanism. So if one node failed, it won't affect the others. Backing up by this perfect iceberg design, Metaflow Fast Data is able to support reading and writing in parallel through optimistic concurrency. So this is how it looks in the graph. So here, we're trying to read from an iceberg table partition into several groups in parallel. Remember, David just showed us like how that two gigabytes per second reading and writing speed you can have when using fast data. So now, since each of these nodes are in independent container, you will enjoy that speed on each node. And this node can be scaled up in horizontally and vertically. That means you can always have bigger nodes, or it can have more nodes. So Metaflow support at most 25,000 for each nodes in one layer, which is like extremely powerful for machine learning uh, use cases that have large assets. So and after you do some your own inference for uh, this data in parallel, we then help you write this data back to Iceberg still in parallel. Wonderful, right? But in fact, you are able to implement everything in this graph on your own using some good things in the open source world. Say you can have your own implementation using um, uh, Pi Iceberg, using Pi Arrow, etc. However, what you can only get in Metaflow Fast Data is that we offer this clean dependency and we offer the performance, high performance C++ layer, and we also have smooth user experience. 
no need to mention that we are one of the first clients that support writing um, writing partition iceberg tables in Python. And all these things could be done within a few lines. So here, let me show you a quick example. Here, we are, go we are reading the table partitions to groups. Each group will have similar record count or size, so it is easier for you to manage the resource assigned to each node. So no more worry about huge partitions anymore. And next, we're going to load these parquet files into pandas data frame in parallel. And then you can just play around your data using all your favorite libraries. You can use pandas, you can use polis, you can use pyarrows, all depend on your choice. After that, uh, before writing the data back to iceberg table, we need to convert them to Metaflow data frame. However, you don't need to worry about that sometimes we're typecasting between pandas and arrow because we'll handle all that behind the scenes for you. You only need to like uh, offer the table and we will do all the casting based on your table iceberg schema. Finally, we put the Meta Metaflow data frame as perky files, put them in S3. However, I need to mention that at this moment, no change has been committed to the table because Instead of commit the write in each parallel node and then like crash your metadata system, what we do is that we will wrap up all the changes later, generate the table metadata change based on that, and then only commit once. In this way, there will be no pressure at all to your metadata system. Woohoo! So that's it. With these 20 lines of code, you already completed a run trip for a gigabytes or tegabytes of data in your Metaflow flow. And yeah, that's everything we have. We're like, I think we still have a few minutes left. Can we take questions? Yeah, so we're open to questions. Any questions? Hi, uh, I'm Anoop. Uh, I have a question on uh, how do you parallelize, like you know, with uh, executor and the uh, main node? Like, how do you use and like? I have worked more on Spark and Scala, so you have UDFs and things like that. So, what do you do for more of like in-memory computation and also yeah. like how do you distribute the work among the executors? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good question. Um, so, can you go back one? So we this top one here for the first part, uh, this sort of the iceberg, uh, the iceberg specification gives you a lot of metadata about your files. So when you're doing this, we're actually like shuffling the files around so that we kind of bin pack them. Uh, and then each one of the nodes from the previous graph gets like roughly around the same amount of data. So that's on the horizontal scaling part, and that's similar to what Spark and other softwares do. Um, now on the in-memory side. Um, interestingly, since, well, you may all be aware that Python is like single process for the most part anyway, um, but since actually the, the lower level components are all written in C++, you can just use Python threads because they release the gill on the C++ part. So we just use normal Python, simple Python threading, um, and then our C++ stuff will operate in parallel under the hood. C++ is what does the actual decoding and encoding, and that's all GIL free. And then so you can just sort of coordinate with threads in Python. So if you look at the Python layer of our code, it's actually quite, quite simple, quite natural uh, code. Most of the heavy lifting is done below that. Just last question, like you can configure the like Spark context, and I'm, I don't know the terminologies what you use here in Metaflow, but I'm just asking like, the driver memory or all those kind of things, right? Oh, okay, that's a good question. This. Yeah, so like um, each one of these nodes is running in a separate container uh, for us, and Metaflow itself has uh, decorators where you can set the machine properties. So this would be like how much memory you want on that machine and all. It's similar, I guess it's similar to the Spark contest. But by the way, we're not nearly as configurable as Spark, but we have some of those sorts of hooks. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, can I go one slide back? Yeah, so you mentioned the small, uh, well, all right. So you mentioned the <laughs> multiple uh, nodes in parallel, each one getting to two gigabytes a second. What is the typical number of nodes that you're running? In That's a good question. Um, it, it's 10, 10 to hundreds typically, but we do have workflows that are in the thousands. And it really depends on the size of the table and how quick they need to process it and how much time they can wait. Um, we, you know, we have huge capacity here at Netflix, so for an important job, we, we can make it happen by horizontally scaling. 
And a quick add-on is that because we are in front engineer, we do pressure tests that we can support 25,000 like for each nodes in one layer. And you can have layer after layer. Say in one for each nodes, you have another 25,000 for each nodes. We don't care. It's like you pay the resource, you choose whatever you like. Uh, 25,000 large EC2 instances might get you a rather large bill, so be careful. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, for, we'll take uh, questions at happy hour. You can find us up. in the happy hour. Happy to answer more questions. Um, thank you.